This morning we're going to study about Jeroboam. Last week we looked at Rehoboam, today Jeroboam, and then next week we will start a series of lessons on grace. Jeroboam, if we were to say, well, who was he? He was the first king of Israel, the northern ten tribes, when the kingdom divided. And I recognize that this graphic doesn't show up so great, but at the top of that tower is a golden calf. And he was the one who put the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And an interesting thing, too, about Jeroboam is as you continue to read through Kings, you'll find subsequent king after king after king compared to Jeroboam. And then there's this phrase, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In fact, I have an idea that the majority of you could have quoted that because when you read your Bible, you, there it is again, there it is again, there it is again. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And you know, as I walk away from reading that again and again and again, now I know someone might think, well, we learned that. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, made Israel to sin. But I think that we could also conclude something else. Something that would have to do with me or you and kind of everybody else. No, 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 I'm not going to be king of Israel, and you're not either. But I would think this, that every one of us will find ourselves in some way in a leadership position. And a leadership position where we affect someone spiritually. Now, someone might raise their hand and say, well, that sounds like elders to me, and I'm not an elder and I'll never be one. And certainly females would have to say, I'm not one and I'll never be one. But no, they're not the only ones who will be spiritual leaders. If you're in a Bible classroom and you've got five children around you, for that period of time, and as they would see you, you're a spiritual leader for them. If you have children, dads, you're a spiritual leader for them, ought to be. Moms, you're a spiritual leader for your children. And we could say is this, uh, husbands, it ought to be your spiritual leader for your wife, your family. Okay, when it's all said and done, subsequent generations later, if they were all compared back to you, your name, son of, would it be who made his family, who made his friends, who made his to sin? I'd hope not. And that is one thing that when I see those golden calves and realize what Jeroboam had done, he made Israel to sin. Let's look at some things about Jeroboam today. First of all, I think you could say Jeroboam's philosophy was the end justifies the means. You know, as you Go in 1 Kings chapter 12. You find that he set up those golden calves. Well, he was promoting idolatry to keep his people, his subjects, those ten tribes, from defecting to Judah. You read in 1 Kings 12, 26 and 27, and Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again 
to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. It's kind of like, I'm king, I want to be king, and I'll do anything to stay king. In other words, the end staying king justified whatever he would do that is in his own mind and in his own heart. That's why he set up those golden calves at Dan and Bethel to keep people from going down to Jerusalem. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Can you imagine, can you imagine any Jew, anyone that had lived at this time period, not knowing and realizing the Ten Commandments, those basic commandments that you read of given by God through Moses? And how does it begin? Exodus 20, beginning of verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You, this is where it starts, you shall have no other gods before me. Then, you will not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. You realize right here, He's violated everything you read. I can't but believe he knew these words and knew that idolatry was wrong. But no matter that he knew it was wrong, his idea is, I'm king, I want to stay king, and I want these people loyal to me. If they go down to Jerusalem, I'll keep them here. I'll put up a calf. I'll give them something to worship. The end justifies the means. He also knew why the throne was taken from Solomon. And it was taken from Solomon because of idolatry. You see, there's kind of an interesting story in chapter 11 of 1 Kings. Ahijah had been commissioned by God to basically anoint Jeroboam. And he took a garment, a new garment, kind of an object lesson, and he was going to tear that garment in pieces. He's going to give ten pieces to Jeroboam. And this was just an object lesson to say, well, verse 31 of 1 Kings 11, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. That's what those ten pieces of that garment represented. And why is he doing this? Why is he going to take the kingdom from Solomon? Verse 33. Now, mind you, Ahijah is telling this to Jeroboam. Because, are you listening? Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Astereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. Now you could summarize the first half of this just with the one word, idolatry. So not only did he know idolatry was wrong, he knows that it's idolatry that has caused these ten tribes to be ripped away from the house of Solomon. But you see, the end justifies the means, doesn't it? I'd suggest, too, he suffered from a lack of faith. Now, I know someone might say, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> Idolatry. Certainly a lack of faith. But you see, God had promised him 
Look at this in 1 Kings 11, 38. This is what, through Ahijah, Jeroboam learns. God is saying to him, if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David, my servant, did. I will be with you and build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. So Jeroboam has been given a promise that you're not going to lose. In fact, as... as, as much as I wanted to establish David, and, 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 and oh, by the way, I did, you know, he keeps two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. I'll do this for you, Jeroboam, if you do what I say. So, you see, he didn't have to build those golden calves. And he just did what God told him to do. God says, I'll establish your kingdom. You know, okay, that's Jeroboam. And the end justifies the means for him. But, you know, sadly, sometimes religious people today will do the same thing. The end justifies the means. Now, you know, the end... Maybe it's so that, you know, everybody leaves so kind of excited that they'll come back. And so we have to do whatever to make sure they leave excited and want to come back. That may be one, as it were, end. There could be many others. You know, like I said, maybe it's not so bold as a golden calf, but unauthorized practices that keeps, so it's thought, the interest of people. You know, may find it in the form of instrumental music, which frankly... Instrumental music in worship is unauthorized. That is, you don't go to the New Testament and read of the worship of the Lord's church and ever find a command or an example or an inference of God's people singing with an instrument. The music that God authorized was simply singing. Beyond that, it would be unauthorized. Or maybe... Lord's Supper on a Friday night, again. You don't go to your New Testament and find authority for the Lord's Supper on a Friday night. You do find God's people on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And so if we're going to do things the way God said do it, and not change it, have the Lord's Supper's on Sunday. Or maybe it's the observation of a man-made religious calendar. Or maybe it's a refusal to deal with negative or controversial topics. And so, in other words, everything feels good. No challenges. But we have to be careful. Friends, the end does not justify the means. And oh, by the way, too, watch out what the end is. Then there was Jeroboam's thinking. His thinking, God's way is too hard. Jeroboam convinced his people that God was requiring too much by expecting them to go to Jerusalem three times a year for feast days. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, you read, So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. You know, somebody might say, What is it with Israel and calves of gold? You know, back at Sinai... And at Sinai, it was Aaron. Aaron, <laughs> how is it you're doing this? And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Interestingly, with Aaron and that golden calf at Sinai, same thing. Behold your gods, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
Once again, what is it with Israel and the golden calf? And these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then he put one in Bethel, the other in Dan. The whole idea, he's justifying it. You've gone down to Jerusalem long enough. It's too hard, too much, too far. It's too hard. You know, sometimes today people would want to water down the, or minimize the Lord's teaching in the New Testament. For instance, you know, some people would demand or think there ought to be women teachers and preachers in the assembly of the Lord's church. In fact, it's kind of this way. If you're going to catch up with the 21st century, you're going to. There has to be that egalitarian nature where women have every position that men have somebody might say well they're they're qualified they have the ability certainly have the the worth you know i wouldn't argue with some of that but it doesn't you know allow for then the job the role the position cuz we got to go back to what god says you know if we were going to talk about qualified, having the ability, having the worth, I'm going to tell you something. Nobody ever, based on his own person, was better than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you agree? But do you know while he was living and on this earth, he couldn't be a priest. Ah, oh, it's just because those Jewish leaders didn't like him. No, 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 that wasn't it. He was not of the tribe of Levi, certainly not a son of Aaron. He was of the tribe of Judah. And people of the tribe of Judah, it didn't matter how godly or good they were. It didn't matter how much people liked them. It didn't matter how good a teacher they might be. They couldn't be priest. Because God had said, they're from Levi, son of Aaron. It's just a matter of things have to be done God's way. No, somebody said, it's too hard. We can't make things hard. We don't ever need to make things harder than God made them. Never need to make things easier than God made them. You know, sometimes people think, you know, it's just too much. It's just too hard for me to worship my Lord every Sunday. And how dare, you know, everybody deserves a vacation. And I don't want to have to take a portion of my day on a vacation and worship God. Surely God doesn't expect that. You know, every week rolls around has a Lord's Day. And we need to be with our Lord on that Lord's Day. No matter where we are. And no matter if it is vacation. We don't need to make things harder than God makes it. We don't need to make things easier than God makes it. Jeroboam's way of thinking is God's way was too hard. Then there was Jeroboam's premise. His way was just as good as God's way. You see, he thought Jeroboam, his plan of worship, was going to be just as good as God's plan of worship. Look what he changed. He changed the place. God's place was in Jerusalem. And Jeroboam's places were at Dan and Bethel. So he made those changes. He thinks his way is just as good as God's ways. He changed the priesthood. God's priests were of the tribe of Levi, Deuteronomy 18.1. Jeroboam's priests were not of the tribe of Levi, 1 Kings 12.13. He's thinking his way is as good as God's way. 
He changed the day of worship. God's Feast of Tabernacles was the 15th day of the seventh month, Numbers 29, 12. And Jeroboam prescribed day was the 15th day of the eighth month, 1 Kings 12, 32. He's thinking, once again, my way is just as good as God's way. He changed the object of worship. Of course, the clear teaching is the object of worship is God, Exodus 20, 3 through 5. But Jeroboam's object of worship was the golden calves. Once again, he's thinking, my way is just as good as God's ways. Now, here's the reason. This explains it all. Look at 1 Kings 12, 33. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month. In the month that he had devised of his own heart. In the month that he had devised of his own heart. Nothing to do with God. It's all to do with Jeroboam. See, he's thinking his way is just as good as God's way. And this we have to be so careful of. By the way, Albert Barnes says of this, he said, The entire system of Jeroboam receives its condemnation in these words. His main fault was that he left a ritual and a worship where all was divinely authorized for ceremonies and services which were wholly of his own devising. Not being a prophet, he had no authority to introduce religious innovations. Not having received any commission to establish new forms, he had no right to expect that any religious benefit would accrue from them. Good words about this phrase, devised of his own heart. Now look at these passages, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord, in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Ah, I think that Jeroboam was leaning on his own understanding. Proverbs 14, 12. By the way, the same words exactly are found in chapter 16, verse 25. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. Seemed right to him to have golden calf at Dan and Bethel, Judges 76. Once again, same words in chapter 21, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. As you read through the book of Judges, you find God's people going into sin, being oppressed by a people... Finally, crying out in repentance to God. God sends a judge. They are delivered. For them to be faithful for a short time, to go back into sin, oppression. Finally, crying out in repentance to be delivered by a judge. Faithfulness for a short time to go back into... You see, you find this pattern over and over and over. It's like, that's the book of Judges. And you know, you're kind of pulling your hair out. It's like, why, why, why? And this is the reason why. Because everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that's where it got him, back in trouble again. And that's the problem, see, here with Jeroboam. He's doing what is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 21, verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. In other words, everybody's doing what they think is right. Somebody says, I think my opinion is right. Well, it's kind of this way. It'd be really weird if you said, I think my opinion's wrong. Why would you... Hold an opinion that you know and believe is wrong. So yeah, what we think, what we believe, we think we're right. That's kind of a truism, really. But he said, the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord really knows. Proverbs 16, 2, similarly. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. In other words, he thinks he's okay. The Lord weighs the spirit. The Lord really knows. Now could Jeroboam, now look at this. Could Jeroboam have done some things differently, yet not violated God's law. Now somebody might say, I don't understand what you're asking. Uh, okay. Could he have done some things differently than Solomon for him? Or David? Or Saul? But yet not violated God's law. For, for instance, perhaps... He could have provided everybody with segues for those going to sacrifice the temple. I know somebody says, <laughs> they didn't have segues then. Um, okay, no, but if they did, would that have violated anything? There was nothing about how you go. 
Well, listen, okay, would it have been wrong for him to have built better roads so that there would be easier travel to the feast days? Yeah, I think we can see that why he might have done something differently than his predecessor and not violated anything, not violated anything in any way to do with God's law and God's teaching. But understand this, it was clearly wrong when he devised of his own heart and then violated or changed God's law. In Deuteronomy 4, 2, you read, and by the way, if we're going to... First five books written by Moses, written about the same period of time. So in essence, you can say, even though the first five books take a chunk out of your first part of your Bible, all that's written about the same time. It's kind of like these are the first of the written words. Well, here's what you find in Deuteronomy 4, 2. You shall not add to the word that I command you or take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So kind of the very first of the Bible. Don't add, don't take from. And a reason. So you keep what God says. Do you know what? You go you go to the very last part of your Bible, probably the last page in your text. You read, I warn everyone who reads the words of the prophets of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So if I go towards the very first, I go to the very end, it's clear. I don't mess with what God teaches. I don't change it. Jeroboam's premise, though, his way was just as good as God's way. Three things. Jeroboam's philosophy, the end justifies the means. Jeroboam's thinking, God's way was too hard. And his premise, his way was just as good as God's way. There is something to be learned from Jeroboam, isn't there? As we close, I'd once again want to bring your minds and thinking back to the cross. That place where Jesus died. Because so much is learned from there. And so much we benefit by. The cross. You know, the cross lets me know that I've sinned. It lets me know of God's love. It lets me know of God's grace. It lets me know that He wants me to be saved. It lets me know the means of that salvation. Jesus shed blood. And we would encourage you, if you have not yet been obedient, that you would, with faith, turn from your sin, confess that faith, so we could assist in your baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And as well, if there's need for prayer, we'd be glad to take the time and pray for you. If you need to come this morning, please.